All right. So, hello everyone, I am Dr. Saili Patil Kayat here. Uh, today in this module, what we are going to talk is about how environmental biotechnology as a field of science can be used for the environmental benefits or for the protection of the environment. We all know that today the environment is suffering from a tremendous degradation, then it could be the pollution, it could be a damage to different environmental sources. It could be water, soil, air and we are facing this degradation of the environment on a day to day basis. So that is how we are going to focus on how different types of the biotechnological tools are getting used for the environmental monitoring for environmental protection as well as for the well being of the environment. So let us start what is environmental biotechnology, why it is so much in the focus today. If we talk about it, there are few key aspects of the environmental biotechnology that are used for the pollution prevention as well as the cleaner production of the environmental products. And the few benefits that environmental biotechnology has to offer are basically the first thing, it is eco-friendly, it is sustainable, it is cost effective, it is 100 percent yield or the product is sustainable. It is very safe, simple as well as it does not generate any harmful waste or the byproducts. And the renewable sources is also one of the important aspect of the environmental biotechnology that are getting used for the cleaner production as well as for the pollution prevention. If you look at the four different intervention points like how environmental biotechnology is going to help the protection or the well being of the environment. So if we talk about it, the first point comes is the pollution prevention. So nowadays we are suffering, we all come across with the air pollution, water pollution, noise pollution, soil pollution. Okay? So how we can prevent it and produce the cleaner options for this purposes? Okay, not only the prevention, the damage which already has been done to the environment, how we can control it. So the pollution control is also one of the intervention that environmental biotechnology has to offer for the well-being of the environment. The third important aspect is the waste management. So this waste could be anything, it could be electronic waste, it could be solid waste, municipal waste, sewage waste, so any type the, of the waste that is getting generated on a day to day basis on a larger scale. The last or the next part is the manufacturing processes. So there are different types of the manufacturing processes are taking place into the different industries. So how we can make these processes more sustainable, more environmental friendly. Okay? So these are the few key intervention points that environmental biotechnology has to offer and it has shown a lot of advantages compared to the conventional methods or compared to the outdated methods. So if we want to talk about these biotechnological tools for the environmental remediation of different sources, there are major four components. As you can see over here is the soil, solid waste, waste water as well as the air and the gases. So the different types of the treatments are getting used for a particular resource of the environment. So for example, if you want to remediate or if you want to bring the contaminated or a degraded soil resource back to its not 100 percent to the natural state, but at least to its original or sim somehow closer to it, there are different techniques like phytoremediation, rhizoremediation, biosparging, bio augmentation, biostimulation which also comprises some in situ as well as the ex situ methods. So we are going to talk about these all aspects as I move on. If you want to clean up the solid waste, there are also different techniques like anaerobic digestions are there, composting, mechanical as well as the biological treatments. Let us talk about the cleaning of, of the air as well as the gases. So what are the methods through the biofilters, bioscrubbers as well as the biotriclers has been developed which plays a very vital role in remediating the polluted air or the gases. The similar thing is for the waste water, there are different types of the aerobic as well as anaerobic bioreactors has been developed which does treat the waste water coming from different industries for example from the pulp industry, pharmaceutical industry uh, or any agricultural industry like fertilizer, pesticide industry. So how we can treat that waste water and it can be used for the secondary purposes. 
So, how does this work? So, how this remediation process works? So, basically there are four major principles that is how it works. If you talk about the first, it is like a removal. So, basically in this strategy, you are trying to remove any contaminant or the pollutant from that area. So, it is a complete removal of that contaminant. The second strategy that you are going to use is called as the separation. So, you are trying to segregate or separate the contaminated zone from the uncontaminated zone. The another strategy or the way is the destruction or the degradation. Okay? So, in this method of the destruction or the degradation, what you are trying to do is there are different tools or technologies which are trying to completely eliminate okay, or degrade the pollutants from that source of pollution. However, the last strategy which, we, which is uh, actually being played is known as the containment or the immobilization. So, you are trying to stop the further flow of any contaminants or the pollutants from the source of contamination to the uncontaminated area. So, these are some of the ways or we can talk about the bioremediation or the biotreatment methods that are most probably are being implemented as, on a lab scale as well as on a field scale trials. Okay, so, when we talk about the remediation, the most what we are going to talk about here is not about physical or the chemical methods, but mostly the biological methods that are getting used for the remediation or for the removal of the contaminants from those polluted sources. So, which are the main factors that influences this process? So, if we categorize them into three, it is basically comprises of environment microorganisms which are naturally existing into those environment and the third one is the contaminant. Okay, so, when we are talking about the environment, it is basically a natural system. What is the temperature, what is the pH, what is the electron acceptors, what are the different environmental natural parameters are available into that affected zone of the pollution. When we are talking about the microorganisms like are the naturally existing microorganisms are capable of removing the pollutants from this contaminated zone. If not, is there any way that we can externally add these microorganisms. So, these microorganisms could be genetically engineered or it could be modified to carry out this particular function. Now, all these two aspects are dependent on what type of contamination is available into that source. Okay? So, what is the toxicity, what is the level of the concentration of the pollutant or the toxicant or the contaminant is there in that area. So, how long is going to take to remediate these pollutants from that source. So, all these different parameters of the contaminants needs to be tested to make sure all these three factors work out very well with each other to be able to be successful to carry out this remediation process. Now, if there are two types of the techniques in the bioremediation, the first one is known as the in situ technique, however, the second one is called as the ex situ. So, in situ is basically you are trying to remediate the site at its own place. Okay? However, the ex situ technique is that you are trying to do this action at some other place or at the some other area of the contamination. So, there are different types uh, that comes under this in situ as well as the ex situ methods. If we talk about the in situ, there are again few factors that you need to consider while selecting any particular technique. For example, there are many uh, in situ techniques like ISCO which is in situ chemical oxidation treatment. However, for the ex situ there are pump and treat is very well known method, but now due to some of the disadvantages of this pump and treat method, this method does not has been implemented in this current age. So, when you want to decide which technique to go for the remediation method, there are always these factors like time contamination zone, concentration, depth and the economy. So, how long this process is going to take? What is the source of the contamination or what is the level or the uh, stretch of this contamination? What is the concentration of the contaminant? How deep this contaminants has reached to th of this soil or the water? And the important and uh, the last factor is the economy.
So, how financially viable these methods are going to be to carry out? So, these are again the factors you need to consider or you can say these are the important criteria need to be considered for selecting the successful remediation technology. Now, here is the chart basically which gives you uh, the different methods are available. We will be talking about each of these methods as we move on. So, the, at every method there are some benefits as well as the limitations are involved. Hence, every site, every case study is very unique. So, you cannot apply a single rule for each and every contaminated site. So, considering these ecological, environmental, biological as well as the contaminant factors that I talked earlier, you need to select the method that is going to be most appropriate and going to give most successful result. So, for the in, so let us move on with the different bioremediation techniques. Okay. Now, we will go with the different types of the case studies. So, which tools and techniques are available for treatment of the wastewater, for the treatment of the groundwater, for the soil as well as for the air. So, we will be talking all these resources and the latest or the advanced biotechnological tools that are available today. So, when you talk about the wastewater, as I said earlier, the wastewater coming from the industries, pharmaceutical, chemical or pulp industry, textile industry. So, the wastewater that is coming out is majority of the time been discharged into the aquifers or discharged into the rivers, lakes without any treatment and hence it is causing a very serious threat to the human as well as to the marine organisms. And that is why it is very important that before you discharge this untreated water directly into the water resources, it is important that you treat it. So, how are the how you can treat it? What are the different ways that you can treat? Because if you consider of the wastewater contaminants, it is mainly contents of the suspended solids, nutrients, heavy metals, pathogens, the priority pollutants as well as the biodegradable organic compounds. So, the wastewater comprises of all these constituents and you are trying to target to remove all these obnoxious materials or toxicants from your water before it has been discharged into the water bodies. So, this is one of the way which is anaerobic system. Here you can see there are different uh, bioreactors. Bio okay. So, if you look at the top one, these are the anaerobic bioreactors. However, there is also one of the way that you can see there are algal ponds are available. So, this system is a mixture or the combination of biological anaerobic as well as the anaerobic system. So, if you look at the top one, it is anaerobic. If you look at this ponds, they are basically the aerobic algal ponds. So, in this system, the thermophilic as well as the mesophilic bacteria are basically playing very important role to degrade the contaminants under the absence of the oxygen. When this process has been carried out, this water has been passed through the algal ponds where the algae in the presence of the oxygen removes the rest of the pollutants. So, as you can see, it is a combination of aerobic as well as the anaerobic methods. Here the treated wastewater is then again used for the secondary purposes. In this case study you can see this is the aquaculture or the fish pond. So, this water is basically used for the culturing of the fishes. So, this is one of the way that how you can treat the wastewater in this case study which was coming from the piggery industry was treated and then for the use for the secondary purposes of feeding the fishes. This is just an overview of the how the system looks like. So, in this system it is not only important to study that how the pollutants are getting removed or treated. It is also important to see that how the microorganisms are playing an important role to carry out this overall process of the transformation. So, the microbial community dynamics or understanding of the microorganisms which are playing a significant role in the mesophilic, thermophilic as well as in the anaerobic condition uh, or the aerobic condition is also significant. Now, here are the different ways as I said there are aerobic and the anaerobic. Let us talk about the aerobic wastewater biotreatment. In this picture what you can see is these are the aerobic lagoons. So, these are the open ponds. Here where you can see is the it is the open area which is divided into different segments and there are aerators. The aerators are basically used to create the movement 
uh, flushing the water so that it enhances the activity, it enhances the surface area of the microorganisms which are present into this system. So, these aerated lagoons or uh, we can say as the aerated basins is a holding or the treatment pond provided with the artificial aeration to promote the biological oxidation of the wastewater. So, the microorganisms are playing a significant role in this process. The second method is that called as a trickling filter. So, here are the trickling filters that is how the schematics looks like. So, what happens in this system is that it is basically a type of the wastewater treatment system which is fitted with the fixed bed. Okay, so, you can see these are the beds which are fixed into the system. Now, these beds are again fitted with the rocks, lava or gravel or di different types of the foam or as well as the pit mosses so that it can hold the contaminants or the pollutants on its surface and it will allow the flow of the treated water for the next use. So, what happens in this system is that as the water moves downwards it causes a layer of the microorganisms on the surface and that is called as a biofilm. So, the biofilm is basically a surface area of the microorganisms which is basically allowing or going to remove the pollutants by the way of the oxidation. So, these uh, trickling filters are also known with the different terms sometimes called as a trickling biofilters, biological filters or they are also known as a trickle filter. However, the principle remains the same. So, once the water flows from these beds of the trickling filters where the biofilms of the microorganisms are there, then it further passes it for the process to the clarifier where it is getting second treatment and then the water is getting removed. It also forms the sludge at the end. So, the sludge is formed at the bottom of the surfaces which can also be further used after the treatment for as a biofertilizer. So, even not a single part has been vested into this aerobic systems. The third system is known as the rotating biological contractors or it is also known as the RCP. As you can see in this image is basically a biological treatment process which is in a round shape. Okay. So, it removes a lot of different types of the grits or solid materials through the screening processes and this happens with the period of the settlement. So, this process involves uh, allowing the wastewater to come in contact with the biological medium to remove the pollutants which are present into the wastewater before it is discharged into the lakes or rivers or different good uh, sources of the water. So, in this method this RCB contractor is a type of the secondary treatment. So, as this RCB contractor moves it allows it allows the microorganisms to create or uh, it facilitates the activity of the microorganisms to grow on the surface of the disk where the biological degradation of this wastewater pollutants takes place. Now, these were ma majority of the methods which comes under the aerobic treatments, but if you talk about the anaerobic treatment as I said earlier there are different types of the digesters or the bioreactors are getting used. Then n number of the bioreactors has been designed based upon your purpose or based upon the type of the wastewater that needs to be treated. This image shows you the typical bioreactor design. Okay. So, if you look into this design what you can see is it has got a main body. Okay. So, this body is basically divided by the thermal jacket. So, it maintains the temperature of the wastewater and they are associated with the sensors which records the temperature which records the different parameters of the water as it has been getting further treated out. It also has the agitation system. So, you can see in the center what is following is the are the agitators. So, it allows the movement of the water continuously. Again these agitators can be fixed based upon the time frame. So, do you need a continuous agitation or do you need a periodic agitation. So, as I said based upon the type of the wastewater that you are trying to treat and the best upon the concentration you can design different types of the bioreactors, but the major principle remains the same that it works under the anaerobic condition where there is a complete absence of the oxygen. 
Okay, so that was about different methods that are used for the remediation or the treatment of the wastewater coming from the different industries. We talked about the wastewater coming from the piggery industry, we talk about the wastewater that is coming from any uh, industries like pulp or the textile. Now let us talk about the groundwater decontamination. Now here how the groundwater gets contaminated? So there are different ways, it could be the spillage of the chemicals, it could be a leaching of the different heavy metals, pollutants that basically happens over a longer period of the time and hence your underground surfaces or the subsurface aquifers gets polluted. In this image what you can see is basically it is the groundwater that has been contaminated with the con chlorinated compounds. So here you can see there are trichloroethene, dichloroethene, vinyl chloride and the ethene is the contaminants. But this process is basically called as a reductive dechlorination where the primary trichloroethene is subsequently getting degraded into sub products like cis dichloroethene, trans dichloroethene then into the vinyl chloride and finally to the ethene which is considered as the environmental safer form. So your intention over this process or this reductive dechlorination is transform the tetrachloroethene or the trichloroethene into the ethene. So how this process happens, so this overall process is basically takes place by the anaerobic microorganism. So there are particular groups of the microorganisms which are quite well studied. For example, dechlorinating microorganisms, there are dehalococcardo species, there are geobacterial species, dehalorespiring species as well which are being studied quite well to see the pattern of the degradation or the reductive degradation or dechlorination of tetrachloroethene to ethene. Okay, uh, besides that the groundwater contamination is generally consists of the two zones. The first zone is considered as a dense non-aqueous phase liquids, however the second is known as the light non-aqueous phase liquids. So what is the difference? So if we talk about DNPLs are uh, basically organic compounds which are heavier than the water and as they are heavier they settle at the bottom. So they have a tendency to go till the bottom of the surfaces. These migrate very fast to the soil formation and reach to the water table because of their high density and the low viscosity. Very good example of this is basically considered as the halogenated uh, aromatics as well as the chlorinated compounds that we talked about in earlier slide which mainly includes tetrachloroethene, trichloroethene, dichloroethene. So these chlorinated solvents are mainly used as a uh, they are used in for the purpose of the dry cleaning agents as well as as a solvents. However, LNPL they are much less viscous, they have low solubility and they are lighter than the water and that is why they generally float on the water and they do not have the ability to go to the bottom and hence these LNPLs are easier to remediate than the DNPLs. The example I can give for this types of the uh, materials are basically gasolines, fuel oil and any other petroleum products. So this is how the DNPL is basically uh, you can see how it migrates. So this is the top surface area which is indicated by the green line as your contaminant is getting leached, it is flowing down alright and the green uh, it passes the upper aquifer and it has the ability to reach to the lower aquifer. So what you can see is the dark zone of the blue color indicates the TNPL because it has a higher density it has reached to the bottom of the lower aquifer. Even here what you can see is the expanded view of the residual LNPLs that are trapped in the pores between the soil and the sediment particles. So since they are very tight it is very difficult to remove these DNPLs from this uh, environmental sources. However, if we talk about LNPLs you can see that they are lighter than the water so they do not have a tendency to reach to the bottom level but however after they have been leaked they reach to the aquifer though they have not reached to the lower aquifer which was the case in the DNPL. 
So, here you can see that is how the dispersion and the dilution occurs and this is the again the image which again shows the expanded view of the residual NNPL which are trapped between the pores and the uh, pores of the soil and the sediment particles. It says that LNPLs are much easier or uh, they are less tedious to clean up than the DNPLs. There is another way of treating the groundwater and it is known as the enhanced in situ anaerobic bioremediation. So, what happens in this system is that basically the whole system is maintained under the anaerobic condition as you can see it is a groundwater contamination. So, this area are lying quite deep well with the under the surfaces. So, it could be lying from 5 meters deep to up to 100 meters deep. So, in that cases here you can see is the source area. So, this is the source area what you can see in this image is that the source area is basically the contamination zone and what you are seeing here is that the contamination barrier which is indicated by this vertical line. So, as your contamination zone or the contaminants passes through the dissolved tube, it passes the barrier and then the treated remediated water is discharged. So, in this process there are basically objectives of this methods are basically source zone where you can treat that area at the source. The second is the plume containment. So, by using the reactive barrier as you can see here these are the barriers. So, you does not allow that contaminated plume to further move and the third one is the plume wide restoration. So, it is a total treatment of the entire dissolved plume. So, it is not only the source zone, but also the neighboring zone as well. This is another way which is quite widely implemented in remediation of the groundwater where you can see there are this is for example, is the contaminated plume which is indicated by the green color and you can see there are horizontal wells or the vertical wells has been injected are called as an injection well. There are also the monitoring wells. So, the middle ones you can see are the monitoring wells. The first one you can see is the injection well. However, the last one that you can see is the extraction well. So, what happens in this system is that it is basically a closed loop circulation system which gives the operator maximum control over the system. So, that you can add the different types of electron donors, nutrients as well as the organisms into the system which will facilitate the natural remediation process and hence it is called as a biostimulation. However, if you find that this naturally existing microorganisms need a further bush to remove this pollutants in a lesser period of the time, then you externally add this microorganisms or the nutrients and this process is called as a bioaugmentation. So, all these nutrients organisms electron donors are injected from the injection well. It is allowed to remain into this contaminated zone where the biological zone is active where the microorganisms are playing a role to remove the pollutants and then over a periodic uh, over a certain period of the time you can remove this uh, remove this water from the extraction well which you can see over here and then after this extraction well you can monitor the different parameters like how much level of the pollutants has gone down whether it has come to the normal permission permissible limit or what are the different parameters like pH, EC, temperature. So, all these different factors can be studied into this system. This is another system which is called as a bio venting where this is an in situ remediation technology which is again used for the microorganisms uh, based on the microorganisms for the groundwater remediation. So, what you can see over here again the oxygen and the nutrient sources or uh, microorganisms are provided into this system and this enhances this activity of the indigenous microorganisms and it stimulates the natural process of the in situ degradation. Again in this method you can see this blue brown zone is basically a contaminated zone and then with the further enhancement of the microbial activity by providing or by including the air or the oxygen flow into this unsaturated zone it will facilitate the removal of the contaminants. So, basically bioventing assist in the degradation of acts of fuel residuals 
uh, as well as the degradation of the volatile organic compounds or we call it the VOCs as the vapors, they move slowly through this biologically active soil. The second way uh, of the treating, the uh, another way of the treating of the groundwater is called as a biosparging. This system is also considered as an in situ remediation technology. The principle is again same, where you are trying to inject the air from the bottom so that it sparges in the upward direction. Now, middle is the contamination zone where you can see the microbial degradation is happening with the sparging of the air from the bottom source. Now, this system or this technology is basically used for the saturated zones to increase the biological activity of the indigenous microorganisms. So, biosparging it can be used to reduce the concentration of the uh, pH which is petroleum hydrocarbons that are dissolved in the groundwater or that could be adsorbed onto the soil surfaces. Now, let us talk about the bio slurping. Basically, it is a mixture of both, it combines the elements of bio venting as well as the bio, uh, bio venting, as well as it involves the principle of the bio slurping. So, if I want to tell you in a simple principle, what happens is that it is the simple formula, it uses a slurp tube. It is, for example, that the same way that a straw in a glass draws the liquid. So, that is how the pump draws the liquid which includes the contaminants and the soil gas up the tube in the same process the stream. Okay, so, the pumping lifts the LNPNs or the DNPLs such as oil off the bottom of the water table and then from the capillary fringes is further used for the treatment on the exit treatment. So, in this method the LNPLs are brought to the surface where it is separated from the water and the air. When I am talking about the NLPL, you can consider oil as an example. This biological process in the term of biosurping refers to the aerobic biological degradation of any hydrocarbons when air is introduced into this unsaturated zones. This is another way which is called as the permeable reactive barrier which is again used for the remediation of the groundwater. For example, here what you can see is basically this is how this permeable reactive barrier looks like. So, it is a barrier, it is a containment which you are inserting in between the contaminated ground water, you are allowing that water to flow through the permeable reactive barriers and what you get after is, is the treated water. Now, in this permeable reactive barriers, it is basically composed or consists of a different types. Okay, uh, in today's uh, market, there are different types of nanoparticles are also used into this permeable reactive barriers. So, main purpose of this method is to basically the removal of the pollutants by sorption and the precipitation by chemical reaction and as well as by the reaction which involve different biological mechanisms. In this case, you can see these bio, uh, PRBs, which is also known as permeable reactive barrier, are fitted with the iron grains. So, these zero valent iron grains are used to capture the pollutants, and these pollutants or these PRBs are then further removed from the zone, which can be flushed or which can then further be reused. So, that is how the PRBs play a significant role in the groundwater remediation. This is a very uh, advanced way that it is still in the infancy stage, but it is known as a microbial electric system. So, if we know the microbial electric system, the principle is that different types of the microorganisms are feeding on the pollutants and then from that feeding, they are generating the electricity or they are generating the bioenergy. So, this is how the picture of the uh, microbial electric system is. So, here you can see is the uh, it is a very laboratory scale small microbial fuel cells has been designed which are separated by the anode and the cathode compartments. So, what happens is that when the microorganisms are feeding on the contaminant which is in this case is tetrachlorothene which is TC and then they are converting they are consuming the electron as acceptors and then with this electron transfer mechanism they are generating a bioenergy. So, it is a very uh, interesting way that can be used for the remediation of the groundwater. In this below picture what you can see is the 
is uh, electron scanning micrograph where you can see the biofilms has been basically <coughs> inserted or you can see the different types of the microorganisms. <coughs> now, let us talk about the marine pollution. So, so far we talked about the wastewater treatment, we talked about the remediation of the groundwater. Now, there is a quite large aspect of the pollution when it comes to the marine pollution because you can see the scale or the vast is quite huge and these are very day to day scenarios that we come across in newspapers in the TV channels and the, there are very famous scenarios or incidences that happened like Gulf of Mexico spill as well as the deep water horizon spill. So, how this large scale of the remediation process can be done? So, we are going to talk about how it works out. So, bioremediation of the oil spill, it is although there have been conventional methods like physical, chemical being used, the biological method is considered as the best because of the environmental uh, outputs it has to offer. This bioremediation principles are basically based upon the two approaches and the first one is the bioaugmentation and the second is the biostimulation. <coughs> So, the bioaugmentation is basically known as the, the oil degrading bacteria which are added to supplement the process of the existing microbial pollution. However, in the biostimulation process is basically allowing the naturally existing indigenous microorganisms to degrade the pollutants and that can be done by the stimulation by providing them the additional nutrients uh, again by providing them the growth limiting core substrates. So, these are the basic two approaches that are implemented in the bioremediation of the oil spills. <coughs> so, the first way is the biosurfactants. So, it is a commercially available biosurfactants are available these days if you want to talk about there are a lot of examples like emulsions are produced by different varieties or different species of the microorganisms. So, biosurfactants are basically are surface active substances which are synthesized by the living cells. Now, here examples include emulsion which are produced by acetonobacter as well as there are sophrolipids which are produced by different types of the yeast which belongs to different candida as well as to the terminal clandis. So, rhamnolipids are different types which are generated from the different species of the pseudomonas for example, is the pseudomonas aeruginosa. So, what happens in this method is basically the surfactant molecules which is oil soluble tells that you can see in this image the round dotted are the tells. So, these are the tells when they come in contact with the water it releases the surfactants into the water while the water soluble ain't remains attached with the water phase. So, while sticking with the water phase it also does the process of the removal or the degradation of the hydrocarbons. So, biosurfactants they were used in many such incidences where the huge or the large scale of the spillage did occur. Again the core exit which is has the active ingredient of the twin AT is basically quite well applied in this scenarios. So, it makes the uh, surfactant isolate droplets of the oil making it soluble or easier for the petroleum consuming microorganisms to feed on it and to degrade those oil. The another way that can be used is called as the oleophilic fertilizers or the biofertilizers. Again, these oleophilic fertilizers or the biofertilizers are comprising of the nitrogen phosphorus nutrients that promotes the growth of the microorganisms which can stimulate or which can degrade these hydrocarbons. Example of this is S200 here as you can see in this image. This is the spreading of the oleophilic fertilizers which has been done on the spillage side. So, it provides the microorganisms more with the nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus which further facilitates the degradation of the pH which is petroleum hydrocarbons or the crude oil or fuel that has been spilled into the source of contamination. There are some interesting ways has been also found out very simple 
eco friendly as well as very cheap and that is by using the human hair as well as the feathers as well as the coconut coils so here there were few news articles few years back which shows that uh, in indonesia a very interesting study was done by a lady who was running her saloon and she found out that why not to use this human oil hair to remove this uh, or to fight this oil spill that happened into the philippines the another way that is also it was used is basically the particles of the coconut coir which is a very organic and which is very sustainable way is basically used in this removal so what happens is this particles of the coconut coir between any about 1 quarter of an inch or 1 inch in the size are utilized for this purposes and the flecks or the granules of this coconut coir pith then they were spread on the surface of the oil spillage site and then these oil uh, droplets they attached to this coconut coil and it was easy to further remove that coconut coil so it was recovered by the scooping so it was also a very interesting and eco friendly as well as the much uh, environmental sustainable way of cleaning the oil spillage now moving to uh, the soil treatment so the soil which is contaminated with this fuels or soil which is contaminated with the hydrocarbons which could be a site when near to the petrol station so in that scenario bio piles they basically they come to our rescue so what happens here is that you can see in the image these are the piles of these contaminated soil has been designed and these piles are fitted with the pipes so these pipes allow the passage of the oxygen from a different interval of the distance now whatever microorganisms are present in this soil they get this extra nutrients extra air to promote the removal of this contaminants and that's how is the basic principle so bio piles are mainly designed to optimize the conditions for the aerobic bacteria to biodegrade the organic contaminants and the effectiveness of this bio piles is basically depends upon the level of the concentration of the contaminant the type of the soil so we can say like soil characteristics as well as the climatic condition but it has been proven that bio piles is very effective method it's very natural the only drawback of this method is consider as it might be time consuming considering the vastness or the scale of your contamination the another way is the land farming as well as the turn windrow the land farming again the principle is the same uh, and even for the turn windrows the principle is same these both are the aerobic methods of the remediation of the pollutants so the windrows that you can see in this image are basically are designed piles but they are less heighted so you can see up to 1.5 to 2 meter into the height and up to 6 meter wide in a lined area and again these piles are aerated periodically by turning the windrows by a specialized machine so it's again a mixture of the mechanical as well as the biological method so after turning or churning these piles again it facilitates the soil organic amendments and the nutrients can be made easily available to the microorganisms to remove this pollution pollutants so the soil characteristics again are important factor in this method that you need to be studied before implementing this technique this is considered as the most often the most cost effective method of ex situ biological treatment as you can see this is not an in situ this contaminated soil has been treated to some other part and that's why it's considered as the ex situ biological treatment of the remediation okay so we so far we talked about remediating techniques for water for the waste water for ground water for the soil as well as on a larger scale on for the marine but when it comes to the air so what are the different methods are available so they are available are considered as the biofilters biotriclers again in the system uh, or even the bio scrubbers so we will just start with the biofilter so what happens is that in the waste gas there is a tremendous different types of the volatile organic compounds are present which can also give a false smell or it can have a bad odor so biotechnology has this potential to remove this pollutants and to remove this odor from the gas by treating it in a biological way 
So, odorous emission basically represent a serious problem to the vicinity of the residential area. So, what can be done is basically in this image what you see is the uh, it is a pipe or you can say it is a biofilter system where you can see this it is a cylindrical system. So, this is a cylindrical system in which the central part is fitted with the biofilm. So, it is a layer of the different microorganisms. In this cases the system is fitted with the hydrogen uh, sulphate, uh, sulphate con, uh, consuming bacteria. So, you can say is the H2S consuming bacteria are fitted into the system. From the bottom uh, the system can be reversible either you can design a system where the contaminated air can flow from the top or even either from the bottom. So, again the design depends upon the type of the gases that you are trying to treat. So, in this scenario the contaminated air is allowed to pass from the top, it passes through the biofilm of the microorganisms which are H2S consuming bacteria, they consume on this contaminants and then after treatment the treated air is passed along with the carbon dioxide and the water vapors. So, here you can see how these microorganisms along with the contaminants they work together. This method is found to be very uh, useful and that is why this method or uh, the system so many of the times has been fitted into the chimneys of the many industries. This is another way that are known as a bio scrubber is basically consists of the washing towers. Okay, so, in this cases what happens is basically the circulation of the fluid corresponds to the mixed liquor. So, again here you can see it is a cylindrical design where the biomedia has been fitted. So, biomedia is again the mixture of the different types of the microorganisms which are known to remove this pollutants from the air. Now, here the treated air or the, um, the dirty air or the air that you are supposed to treat is allowed to pass from the bottom channel, it passes up, it, being gets, it gets in contact with the biomedia where it is being fed up or which is being treated by using mixture of the microorganisms and then the treated air further comes out from the top outlet. So, bio scrubbers are the most suitable system for the treatment of highly water soluble compounds. So, if you have any contaminants which are highly water soluble, then you can definitely think of using the bio scrubbers. Again, the bio scrubbers they consist of the different types of the surface areas so that the microorganisms can attach or they can form the biofilm on it, and that is why the pumice stones are generally used into the bio scrubbers. So, this operation generally involves the making the gas flow in the con uh, counter current to the liquid where the contaminants and the oxygen are absorbed and subsequently the liquid is fed to the reactor which is packed with this material and again which is covered with the biofilms and that is responsible for the main removal of the pollutants. The third way is the biotrickling uh, or it is also known as the biotrickling filters. It is a combination of both like a bio scrubber as well as the bio filter. So, again in this method what happens is what you can see in this image are the cylindrical weights or the cylindrical towers which are fitted with the pumice stones and which has a layer of the microorganisms. So, biofilms are designed into this. So, here as you can see. Uh, here as you can see that the odors are basically this is how this uh, system that you can see the red gas is basically a contaminated gas or the odors are getting into the system then it gets treated and then it is coming out. So, the microorganisms are working very well together to remove this pollutants and that is how the ultimate outcome that you get is a less odorous amount of the gas that can be then for the discharge into the environment. So, additionally non soluble volatile organic compounds should possibly remove from this waste gas in acceptably residence time. So, that is one of the advantage of using the bio trickling technology. So, now so far we are talking about the role of the microbes into different types of the contaminated areas. However, there is also very important interaction has been noticed which is considered as the plant and the microorganism interaction which is called as a phytoremediation. 
So, basically in a simple term phytoremediation is the method or is a strategy which is used to remove the pollutants by the root system or different parts of the plants in association with the naturally existing microorganisms. So, how this mechanism takes place there are different types of the phytoremediation mechanism there are phyto extraction, phyto transformation, phyto stabilization even the rhizo degradation. So, rhizo degradation is basically the removal of the pollutants from the rhizosphere. However, the rhizo filtration is the water remediation mechanism in which the contaminants are removed by the root system of the plant. So, we will be talking just if you want to see how these different mechanisms do work. So, for example, here uh, start with there are the pollutants in the soil, the pollutants have been taken up, they are consumed by the root system. If these pollutants are getting stabilized into the root system and then they are further contained, it is known as a phytostabilization. So, it does not allow the system or the plant part does not allow the further dispersion of the pollutants. So, it captures those pollutants into that part of its tissues. There are again the way like phytodegradation. In phytodegradation, what happens is that the tissue cells of the plant is try to degrade or try to make it less pollutants for the plant or for the nearing locality or the nearing soil environment. Phytovolatization is the mechanism in which the contaminants are basically sent back into the environment when they are being completely treated. So, there is no harm, the level of the toxicity is completely been neutralized. However, the phytoaccumulation as you can see over here, the root system completely accumulates the different types of the pollutants into its root zone and it restricts the further mobilization of the pollutants. So, these are the different mechanisms in which phytoremediation system works, where different types of the plants if I want to give the example there are canna very well known species like canna, canna indica, vetiver are some of the very well known plant species or the local wild shrubs are getting used for this remediation purposes. Now, this is one of the examples that you can see is basically called as a floating island. So, this is a, a case study which was conducted in the Loktuk Lake, uh, where the amount of the waste water they had was enormous. And for that purposes, they thought of using this bioremediation practice of using the phytoremediation plants. So, these were the local grasses were used, where the root system of this grasses were allowed to come in contact in a pond shape of this water and then it was further remediated with the help of the microorganisms that are present into the water and it was found to be a very successful case study. It is not only how the microbes comes in contact or interact with the plants, they also come in contact or interact with the metals as well to carry out different mechanisms of the bioremediation and they are called as the bioaccumulation, biomineralization, biotransformation as well as the bioleaching and the bioabsorption. So, we will be talking about each of this how these microorganisms does interact with the metal to carry out the remediation processes. So, let us start with the bio leaching. So, what is bio leaching? This is also uh, in one way called as a bio refining. So, it is basically the extraction of the metals from their ores through the use of the microorganisms. So, this is the much cleaner as you can see because we are using the microorganisms than any traditional chemical method which are used for the leaching by where the cyanide was used which is considered as very toxic and the carcinogenic chemical. So, in this process of bioleaching which is one of the several applications within biohydrometallurgy and the several methods are used to recover different types of the metals for example, zinc, lead, arsenic, antimony, even the copper. So, what happens are is that the different types of the microorganisms or the bacterial species such as acidithiobacillus peroxidans and acidithiobacillus thiooxidans is a very good example if I want to cite over here. What they does is that the iron, uh, ions are used to oxidize these ores. So, this step is entirely independent of the microorganisms and what role these microorganisms or the bacteria are playing is the further oxidation 
of this ore, but also the regeneration of the chemical oxidants. Okay, so, for example, in this uh, study or uh, in this image what you can see is the similar process like the bacteria are catalyzing or breaking down the mineral pyrites okay, by oxidizing the sulfur and the metal. So, in this case we are talking about the iron by using the oxygen. So, this is the soluble products that can be further purified and refined to yield the desired metal. So, it is not just limited to fungal strains, but there are many other bacterial strains has been today been discovered who can do a similar process of the biology chain. Now, there are different uh, biotechnological tools are used to design biosensors for environmental monitoring. So, what are these biosensors? Basically, they are the analytical devices which are composed of biological sensing elements or uh, we can call it the biomarkers which can comprise of the enzymes, which can comprise of the receptors or DNA, antibodies, etcetera. In when they come in intimate contact with a physical transducer, so which could be optical mass or in the form of the signal. So, it could be an electrochemical one, which together relate the concentration of an analyte to be measured in the form of the signal. So, just to make it easy, it says that these biosensors are used to detect the presence of the pollutants and also to detect the level of the concentration of those pollutants. So, it works very well in the bioremediation studies. This is just how one of the example that how these biosensors are designed. For example, the first plate it shows you the biolock plate. So, this is the biolock plate which has been used for the detection of the hydrocarbon consuming bacteria whether they are present into a contaminated zone or not or what is their activity. So, what happens is that this biolock plate is fitted with the different types of the hydrocarbons. So there are different six types of the hydrocarbons based upon the presence of this microorganisms when they come in contact with this hydrocarbons, they start feeding on it or they start working on it and this releases the signals in the form of the different colors. So, here you can see there are different shades of the purple color, color is there. So, after this analysis, this biolog plates are been read by using the biolog reader or the biolog plate reader and it measures the concentration of the hydrocarbon degrading bacteria that can be present into this area. So, that is how it, it indicates. The similar is how the microarray analysis are best on the gene signal. So, here again you can see there is a control sample and there is an experimental sample. So, here the mRNA extracts are used, they are reverse transcripted and they based upon the amount of the fluorescence that they are emitting after labeling these uh, extracts it gives you the final image. So, based upon their fluorescence signal you can consider that how much amount of the gene or the gene presence or absence is there into a given particular experimental sample. This is again a one of the way of showing the molecular biology to the bioremediation. So, so far we were talking about in situ, ex situ and we were talking about the microorganisms. So, you know that microorganisms play a very significant role in the bioremediation, but how you will know that which microorganism is present or which microorganism is playing a particular role in the particular action of the removing the contaminants and for that purpose molecular biology plays a very important role. So, the methods which are best upon 16S RNA like DNA extraction, polymer chain reaction based on the uh, genomic DNA extracts as well as there are some other methods like denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis, TRFLP and then the sequencing. So, all this process which at the end gives us the sequencing data which allows us to understand the identifying the microbial communities that are present. It is why it is very important, it is very important to understand uh, also to develop the consortia that you want to design for the bio augmentation purposes. The molecular biological tools like I say 16 S RNA based like PCR, DGG, TRFA are currently being used, but there is a further development 
into this method and there is a next generation sequencing which is called as a NGS platform is coming. So, there are variety of the platforms like there are ion proton, uh, there are many such machines are coming up which are helping not only at the metagenomics level, but also at the proteomics level they are giving us a very high throughput information or uh, they are giving a very detailed insight into these microbial arena for example, the pollutants many of which are still unknown. So, that how to design efficient monitoring tools. So, these NGS platforms are very significant in this manner to monitor the environmental damage as well as to restore it. Another way or another way to look forward is the nano remediation. So, application of nanotechnology which is based upon the synthesis of nanoparticles, nanomaterials for cleaning up these environmental damages is also getting used. Okay, so, these are I hope these you found out this, this module quite interesting. As you can see we are talking we talked a lot about uh, many ways or many techniques or strategies to look forward for a greener and a sustainable future. Okay, so, the contribution what biotechnology has to offer it is quite wide. It is not only limited to the water, it is not only limited to the soil or air, it is limited to each, each and every aspect. So, by using different integrated biological system that we talked about for remediating the wastewater, we talk about the uh, bio slurping, bio venting, bio augmenting methods for remediating the ground water. We also talk about bio piles, land farming as well as the windrows, how you can use those techniques for the exit remediation of the soil which is contaminated with the hydrocarbon pollutants. Even for the marine spillage how it can be used like the biosurfactants. So, there are many advantages in this biotechnology that has to offer for the environmental protection, environmental damage or the for the environmental restoration. Besides that it has also the potential to give us the better understanding of different microbial capabilities which can be playing a very significant role in the microbial remediation uh, by the removal of the contaminants. So, development of many sustainable remediation system has been used on the laboratory scale and now is been taking place on a very large scale and one of the good example of that I talked about was about using a microbial electric system where microorganisms feed on the pollutants and they generate the electricity which can be used in the bioenergical form. Besides as we are moving there is an understanding of the green nano remediation techniques are further taking place. So, we are have a hope to look forward for a greener and a sustainable future by using the environmental biotechnology. So, that is about it and thank you so much and I hope you found this module very helpful for your academic studies. Thanks.